you're, you're good. We have the wrong microphone on. <laughs> there are two microphones here. Rochester um, Monday sometime and our daughter will be going back in for her second surgery so um, we'll be there all of next week so we can just say a special prayer for, for Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you for us. Yeah, we will. Um, I, I just need to know that we will. The, for the family, for Mabel's family and your, your family as well as you uh, prepare for an injury to surgery this week. We let us uh, pause and remember. Anything else? Yeah, there's a copy of Please stand for the call to worship. Advent is a time to watch. We watch and hope for the Lord. O come, Emmanuel. During Advent, we watch for hope in the midst of despair. During Advent, we watch for forgiveness in the midst of rebellion. During Advent, we watch for peace in the midst of conflict. We watch and hope for the Lord. O come, Emmanuel. During Advent, we watch for the presence of God in the midst of a fallen world. This morning, we light two candles. The first candle reminds us that Advent is a time of hopeful waiting. We wait in anticipation for God to fulfill every promise set forth in the Bible. The second candle reminds us that Advent is also a time of faithful watching. 
we watch with expectant eyes, trusting that God is active, present, and constantly at work, leading all of creation toward the plan of redemption. As we light the second candle, we ask for faith to watch for God's presence and open eyes to see all that God is doing. Let us pray together. O oh God, as we learn to wait in faith, help us now to watch in expectation. Open our eyes that we might see the ways you are at work around us, within us, and through us. Amen. Our hymn of praise is number 189, Angels from the Realm of Glory. find ourselves irritable and preoccupied with the pulsating and demanding rhythms of the season, have, have mercy, mercy on us, O Lord. When we talk peace, but do not walk peace, have, have mercy, mercy on us, O Lord. When we push away and keep out others who are different, have, have mercy, mercy on us, O Lord. When kindness and generosity fail us, grant that we may be conscious of your presence during this season so that we may stay centered in the sacredness of each moment. Let's take a time for a personal confession. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come, my deliverance will be revealed. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Response this morning is Jesus Loves Me, number 437.
this is one of the joyful opportunities that a pastor has is to renew vows. I've said before that Ingrid and I have renewed three times. It's a good thing. And uh, Bob and Chris wanted to renew their vows, so Bob and Chris, come on up. And you even remembered which side to stand on. <laughs> I did too. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, friends, we are here in God's presence to share in the renewal of the marriage covenant. We are here in an atmosphere of love and trust and hope and serious intent, affirming God's continued blessing on the relationship of Bob and Chris Hansen. We are also here to acknowledge the life-giving power of love to which God calls us all. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that we can gather this day and celebrate with Bob and Chris. Lord, you brought them together and you have helped them stay together and deepened their love for each other. We thank you that you are here to bless this time of renewal. May we all celebrate not only the human love that binds husband and wife, but also your love, O oh Lord, that strengthens each one of us to practice your love in our everyday lives. We ask that you bless this service and the vows Bob and Chris take here today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So did you use 1 Corinthians 13 for your wedding? <laughs> well, just, just about everybody does. Mm -hmm. And I just want to remind you, you can see here, that that whole chapter, most of the chapter ahead of it is highlighted. And it begins, if I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understanding of all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I have nothing. If I give away all my possessions and hand over my body so that, it may, so that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Does not insist on its own way and is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. Amen. 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 Genuine love is a blessing where two persons have chosen to share a common journey. Bob and Chris, your lives have been blessed by the love you have found together. Cherish that love and allow it to continue to grow. Support each other's dreams and aspirations. Make your home a place of peace and harmony, a sanctuary for refreshment and renewal. Continue to, experience, to share your joys and disappointments, for in sharing your experiences deepen. Continue to treat each other with respect and consideration, mindful of how you wish to be treated. Or in the words of our Lord, love one another as I have loved you. So here are the questions. Bob, do you offer to Chris your continuing love, support, trust, faithfulness, and total honesty through all of life's changing circumstances? If you do, say, I do. I do. Amen. Hey, Chris, do you offer to Bob your continuing love, support, trust, faithfulness, and total honesty through all of life's changing circumstances? If you do, say, I do. I do. Amen. Now, are there rings? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that these rings are a symbol of the love that Bob and Chris have for each other, a never-ending symbol. And we pray that you will bless them anew, that they will continue to be that symbol and reminding of what you have done for us and what we can do for each other in the love relationship. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now hold these rings as a, as a sign of your love for each other, knowing that love is delicate and fragile, yet strong and life-giving. Now place them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.
I'll bet when you got married, it was hard to put it on too, right? <laughs> <laughs> it always is. <laughs> Bob and Chris, you have now declared your intent to renew your commitment and pledge to each other in marriage. God affirms your covenant and as a source of happiness and strength. Now, as you have given renewal to your vows through verbal statement, the joining of hands, and the reaffirming of rings, we happily acknowledge the reaffirmation and solidarity of your marriage. Amen. Let us pray. Put your hands together. Let me put your hands on yours. Yeah. Eternal God, creator and preserver of all life, author of salvation, giver of all grace. Bless and sanctify with your Holy Spirit, Chris and Bob, who have reaffirmed their marriage covenant. Enable them to grow in love and peace with you and with each other all their days, that they may reach out in concern and service to the world. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who unites us all. Amen. Amen. The scripture reading for today comes from Malachi 3, 1 through 4. It's on page 772 in your pew Bibles. See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judea and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. The second reading is from Luke 3, 1 through 6, page 829 in your pew Bibles. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Iteria and Trachnotus, and Lysenia, ruler of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Annas and Ca Ca Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, Make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. appreciate the pattern that you set for all of us. Uh, Reverend Doctor Morgan. Because I like to be down here on the same level with all of you and, and just um, having been a teacher and a coach, I think often I, I revert to teaching and, and coaching. And so looking you in the eye and walking down the aisle and talking to you, I, I think is that's how I do things. And, and I think that the response, I love seeing the responses in your faces because you preach this as much as I do. I can't do it without you. So as we prepare to consider these scriptures that we've read in the time of this season, let us pause for a moment to pray. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit to recreate us and through us Renew your presence throughout the earth. O oh God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by your same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy your consolation. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. 
Amen. Amen. So as I thought about these messengers, these scriptures, um, I thought, so, so as Luke began his, that passage um, in our gospel lesson, he, he, he set some markers out there for us, some Roman rulers and some um, Jewish teachers and leaders. And who would they be in our day, in our generation? In this 21st century, who would, who, as if people described our lives in faith together, who would be the markers? You know, for us personally, our, our little um, main Presbyterian historian would probably mention Reverend Dr. Ed Morgan as, as the spiritual leader of this time for us. And there are other spiritual leaders too. I think that, um, that Pope Francis has chose Francis as his name and, and is, Following that model, and I've saw, uh, just recently I saw something on Facebook where a, a, a small child got away from a parent and came up and stood beside him, and he just seated her and put his hand on her head or on, on her hands, and, and, and she just stayed there and watched him while he preached. Mm -hmm. Wow, let the children lead us. And, and that was a wonderful gesture for, for the church, but for all Christians everywhere. But others, you know, in our lifetime, in, in our generation, what about like Dr. Martin Luther King? Um, what about, um, well, we talk about each ad administration, the Reagan era, you know, and, and the Biden era. And, but if we look back a little bit further, that in, in, the spirit, in our spiritual world and history, we have... Um, we have Martin Luther, we have John Knox, we have John Calvin, we have uh, John and Charles Wesley. And if we look back a little bit further, we've got Francis of Assisi and Nicholas, the Bishop of Myra. Do you know who I'm talking about? Yeah, let's come back to that. You, you know about Nicholas, the Bishop of Myra? Oh, I put it back. Yeah, let's put it on right here. You know, when you see one of these, we call them Santas. A friend of mine carved this and gave it to me. But when you look, if you look it up, if you look up uh, the Bishop Nicholas of Myra, which was like around between three and 400 AD. And did you realize that that was the time, the three to 400 AD? I've left my notes already. You're in trouble. We might be here till noon. But, but at that time, that's the time they put the Bible together. Really, that's when, that's when our canon became the scriptures. And the, the stories are that Nicholas, the bishop of Myra, and that back then they wore these things. And then the, and I have the robe to go with this, but I left it at home. I didn't think you needed that. I thought this was probably more than enough to help make the point. But he also... Do you remember the Council of Nicaea? Do you remember the Nicene Creed? Yeah, well, the, the story is that Bishop Nicholas so disagreed so profoundly with Arius that they almost got into fisticuffs, and he, was, he actually slapped Arius' face and was uh, defrocked and put in prison for a while. Now, this is... Nicholas, the bishop of Myra, from like, I think he became a bishop like in 340 AD. You know, the interesting thing of this story, and I'll get back to this, but it was Francis of Assisi that followed his model, and I'll talk about that in a bit. But first, let's go back to our gospel lesson for the second Sunday of Advent. Luke, the historian, uses references to Roman rulers, Jewish leaders of that day, and it establishes the time and place in history that all this happened. So we talk about our historians. Who would it be for today? And then Luke goes on to quote the words from Isaiah 40. And those words are really familiar to all of us. The beginning of the second book of Isaiah in chapter 40, you know, it's really in three sections. So in the 40 is the beginning of the second piece of it. And it begins, comfort, oh, comfort my people. Remember that? This is, we read that a lot at this time of year. Comfort, oh, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tender, tenderly to Jerusalem. 
and cry to her that she has served her term and her penalty is paid. She's received from the Lord hands double for all of her sins. And then it goes, a voice cries out in the wilderness, what we just read today. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill be made low, and even the ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all the people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This happened in Isaiah, this prophet, this messenger, Isaiah. It was shortly before the reign of Cyrus of Persia. You ever heard of that? Cyrus of Persia, uh, they um, conquered the then that part of the world, and, and he took over Babylon. And, but he was kind to the Israelites. He allowed them to go back home. Cyrus did. So he allowed the Israelites to return to their homeland. This messenger, prophet Isaiah, was preaching a word of comfort and encouragement to exiled Israelites who were soon to go home. So this sermon chapter in Isaiah also ends with some other really familiar words that would have been a that have been a great comfort to many of us, especially like families like Maybell's family. When we gather together to celebrate a life well and long lived like that, often we use the very end of Isaiah 40. Do you remember that, 28 through 31? Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. And here's the part you all remember. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So that's the end of this passage, this sermon from Isaiah to the people at that time who were still in exile but would soon be going home. And Luke uses this very same passage to proclaim the prophetic ministry of John the Baptist, the new messenger for the day. Malachi, which means messenger, is a collection of prophecies dominated by a call to holiness. That's what we come here for. That's what we gather together for, is for that call to, re to renew our vows to each other and to the Lord, a, a renewed call to holiness. Advent's a time of watching and waiting and preparing and renewing our call to holiness. The name Malachi could just be a sermon title meaning, meaning messenger, or it could have been the name of the author, which means messenger. I kind of like the idea that it was really Malachi's name, that there really was a Malachi who wrote this and his name really was Malachi. You know, I, I like that idea so much and I'll bet you do too because I'll bet you the names for your children if they weren't from a family member were because of what they meant. Like my son, Christopher, Christ bearer, messenger. Christopher means Christ bearer. That's why I named him that because the, so that he would be a messenger too and, and understand that just like Malachi. He's probably glad I didn't name him Malachi. So now let's look a little closer at that first lesson. Every time I read this passage, passage I get caught by verses 2 and 3 of our gospel lesson. You probably do too. 2 says, but who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? For he's like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver and he will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Well, John the Baptist apparently choked on this prophetic message from Malachi and took it to heart. John the Baptist, you know, the son of Zechariah and Elizabeth, had a double lineage in the priestful tribe of Levi. He took it personal because he was a Levite, and he left the priesthood. You know, his dad was a priesthood. He was a priest of Levi. He was going to be a priest, and, and John, you know what John did. That's what this passage is about. 
And that's what our story is about too. Just think about it. He will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. Seems that John the Baptist may have taken this literally and personally. Left his responsibility to follow in his dad's footsteps and instead he became the voice crying in the wilderness. Preparing the way the Lord calling for repentance. Wow. Turn up the heat and turn back the clock. It's Advent 2021. So, have you ever experienced the refiner's fire? I'm sure you have. Or the Fuller's soap. Let me talk about Fuller's soap. So Richard and Alan and Russell and Norman Fuller were all my friends in Sunday school. They were in elementary and junior high. When I was in elementary and junior high, we all went to Sunday school and church together. And their single mom, Eloise, really had her hands full. Not that my mom didn't, but my mom had dad. And Eloise was on her own with these four boys. And they regularly received Eloise Fuller soap when their language was deemed inappropriate by mom. You getting the gist of the story? She was not one to withhold the soap or spare the rod and spoil the boys. Her soap did not prevent any pandemics, but I'm afraid that today inappropriate language has reached nearly pandemic levels. Sandy and I tried to watch, we, I really wanted to watch Yellowstone, and we watched a couple of episodes. I want to watch it, but I can't do it. I can't tolerate. You know, back in the olden days when I was coaching wrestling in the late 70s, I kicked the boys off for talking like that. I kicked one of the boys off the team for swearing, and he, he said, I'm not coming back. And I said, well, guy, that'll sh sure hurt us. But if you don't come back, it'll hurt you more. Well, he came back and talked to me, and, and he never did that again. And a few years after that, I think I've told you about Guy Mefford. He, I got a, a registered letter inviting me to his commissioning as a Navy SEAL. He learned to hold his tongue and other things, too. And recently he found me on Facebook and wanted to talk and he had retired as a Navy SEAL. So he got that one taken care of. But we're all called to use the means we need to help each other have better behavior and it was fuller soap for my friends, uh, Russell and Alan and Norman and Richard. So Psalms 24, three and five, you know, like we, we all know Psalm 23, Psalm 24, go look at it, it's pretty cool. But three through five says, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in this holy place? Those who have clean hands and a pure heart and who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully. Hmm. They will receive blessings from the Lord and vindication from, from the God of their salvation. So let us wash up and get ready for Christmas. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. So I read that silversmiths, do you know the story about uh, refining silver? That they heat that silver, that molten silver, until it's pure, and they know it's pure when they can clearly see their reflection in the molten silver. So I think when we are, experience the heat enough that we become pure enough that the purifier, God can see God's own reflection in our faces if when we reach that kind of purification, when we do the best we can with what we have, when we realize that God's forgiveness is true and is for us, that God can begin to see his reflection in us just like the silversmith can see his reflection in the purified molten silver. So our call... Let me back up. Let us remember that the desire of John the Baptist for all people to see God at work and to recognize Jesus as God has not changed at all. But many cultures, people, places are different today, and our culture is changing too. So our call is to faithfully be messengers of this good news. Let our lives fully reflect God's grace. Without attention to the needs of those around us, those on the receiving end, we cannot follow the lead of Malachi and John the Baptist. 
So especially in this season of Advent and Christmas, let us remember the bishops who have gone before us and let us reclaim our heritage. When people say Santa, think Saint Nick. So did you know that back in those days, it was Saint Nicholas and it was the Dutch, which includes some of us, that couldn't say Saint Nicholas and it ended up being Sinterklaas. And it was Coca-Cola's advertisements that had the round, happy-faced, jolly, ho-ho-ho Santa that kind of changed the image in America and in the world from Sinterklaas or Saint Nicholas or Bishop Nicholas to Santa. Let's take him back. I like taking our holidays back. They were ours in the beginning and they are still ours. So in this season, let's, let's turn the story back to the saints who surround us. And because it was, it was St. Francis of Assisi who followed the image. So St. Nicholas took seriously what Jesus said to the rich young ruler. You remember that story too, when the rich young ruler said, so what do I have to do? And he said, sell all that you have and give it to the poor. So St. Nicholas underwent the fire when his parents died in what to them was a pandemic. It was an epidemic, the books, <clears throat> the history books call it. His parents, rich parents died in a pandemic. He got touched by the Holy Spirit and sold all of his inheritance and gave it all to the poor and soon after became the, a bishop and led the church uh, dramatically at that time. And it was 800 years later that Francis of Assisi experienced the same thing, apparently knew the story of Bishop Nicholas and he, after his parents died, sold all that he had and gave it all to the poor. Did you know that about Francis of Assisi? You know, we, we call them saints, St. Francis and St. Nicholas, but they, they were messengers that took the message seriously and sold a rich young man that took all, all they had and sold it and gave it to the poor. Guess where the idea of gift giving at Christmas began? It began in the church, 300 A.D., repeated in 800 A.D., and continues to this day. So when we give our gifts, and when you receive the gifts, remember the real giver. And remember that the wilderness of northern Minnesota still needs prophetic messengers, too. There is joy to be spread and truth to be told. Let us let our lives tell the story here and now. Let's turn to number 358, and let's tell the story in song. Love divine, all loves excelling.
this is a joyful time that we can affirm uh, Reverend Bob Kirsten's ministry here, starting as pastor on January 1st. So it is getting near, <laughs> nearer and nearer. And I like that old song and it, because of it's getting nearer and nearer, <laughs> my friend. So part of that uh, recognition of ministry is just asking some faith questions and, uh, and also affirming our role as a congregation. At the end of this, this uh, order of service, I'm going to invite all of you to come up and put a hand either on Bob's shoulder or on somebody's shoulder around you. And uh, we're going to pray and anoint Bob to this time of his life. So, as in one body, we have many parts, and each part has its own function. So all of us together with Christ are one body, and we all belong to each other. We have different gifts according to the grace God has given us. If your gift is to hear God's word, speak it out in faith. If your gift is service, live to serve others. If your gift is the heart of a teacher, teach what is true. Let preachers preach with conviction and givers give freely. Let officers work diligent for the people and let those who serve the poor serve gladly. Let us not lack for enthusiasm, but be ardent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in suffering, constant in prayer, supporting one another, and welcoming all. Now let me... I will find the right spot here in just a moment. Yes, here we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. These are constitutional questions that we ask that every, actually every elder and every pastor who is both ordained and also brought in the church as a pastor. And it, most of them are reaffirmation of faith that Bob has already expressed. Now I ask you, do you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, your savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church and through him, believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yes, I do. Amen. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? Absolutely. Yes, I do. Amen. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith they express in the confession of our church, and I would say both of our churches? Yes, I do. Amen. Will you be a minister of the word and sacraments in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and continually be guided by our confessions? Yes, I will. And will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Absolutely. Yes, I will. And will you in your own life Seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world. Yes, I will. Amen. And do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? I do. And will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? To the best of my ability, I will. Amen. And will you be a faithful minister proclaiming good news in word and sacrament, teaching faith, and caring for people? Will you be active in government and discipline, serving in the governing bodies of the church? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Yes, I will. And do now, right. Linda, as clerk of session, has some questions. As clerk of session, I address you, the members of the congregation. Do we, the members of the church, accept Pastor Bob as our pastor chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to guide us in the way of Jesus Christ? If so, answer, we do. We do. Do we agree to encourage him to respect his decisions, follow as he guides us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of the church? If so, answer, we do. We do. Do we promise to pay him fairly and provide for his welfare as he works among us, to stand by him in trouble and share his joy? Will we listen to the word he preaches, welcome him 
with pastoral care and honor his authority as he seeks to honor and obey Jesus Christ our Lord. If so, answer, we do and we will. We do and we will. And we're going to pray and then we're going to do the ancient ceremony of laying on of hands. And I love that ceremony. I know you would too. Because the Holy Spirit is really with us. We, we don't Amen. do this alone. Not as a congregation, not as pastors, not as elders. We all do it together with the Holy, power of the Holy Spirit. So let's pray. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that we may be faithful as your people and faith fruitful in the ministries you have given us. Grant diligence to those who lead, faith to those who teach, truth to all who speak, compassion to all who heal, wisdom to those who counsel, generosity to those who give, and cheerfulness to all who serve. To your servant, Bob Kirsten, and to all who tend your flock as pastors among your people, give vision and strength, hospitality, humility, and peace. Bless the common ministry of this pastor and, and the people of the Maine Presbyterian Church. Bless them with joy and power in the gospel. Strengthen us to live out the grace of our baptism and to serve you with the gifts of your Holy Spirit. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our only shepherd and Lord. Amen. Now, would you all come up? This is your chance to come forward. I, I would put an offering plate up here, but it's okay. <laughs> Come on up, Bob. You can stand here in the middle. And like I say, if, if you can't touch the person up here, then touch someone next to you. Let us pray. Lord God, we know that you, you have poured out your Holy Spirit on Bob. You have called him to ministry you have supported and helped him along the way. And now at this new juncture of his ministry with these good people here at Maine Presbyterian Church, we pray for a special power and grace and love. And once again, Lord, be with all the people here. Be with Bob as he leads and serves. And we give you thanks and praise in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Let us continue to be in an attitude of prayer as we, as you have prayed for me, let us all pray for one another. God of the ages. We praise you for in the dawn of time you created the world, sending light by your word to dispel darkness. In Jesus Christ you began a new creation, sending him to be light of the world, to drive away fear and despair and to rule in peace and justice, holiness and love. Especially, O oh Lord, we thank you for the order and beauty of your creation, the purity of the new fallen snow. We Thank you for coming in Christ Jesus to share our human life for the place you give us in your continuing creation and in this congregation. For the promise of peace among all nations and justice for all peoples. And we thank you for the church as a sign of your coming kingdom. Mighty God, prepare the world for your rule. For we long for the day when there shall be no more crying or tears and death will be destroyed. Help us to share the ministry of Christ and be agents of his compassion. Especially, O oh Lord, we pray for our families here, for the family of Mabel Borgred. We pray for the nations of the earth and peace in the world. We pray for victims and survivors of violence. We pray for those who are sick and suffering. We pray especially for Cynthia this week as she has surgery and her family surrounds her there. We pray that you will continue to work your miracles among us, those miracles that you work every day through modern medicine be working in us and for our behalf, even and especially this day and this week. We pray for all of our families and friends. We pray for Bob and Sharon and Merv and Phyllis and, 
and Bob and Chris too as they renewed their vows this day with us and for others whom we name before you. Lord, we offer these prayers, the ones said aloud and the ones yet in our hearts. And all this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue to share our gifts with each other in the world. And especially now as we receive this morning's offering, will our ushers please bring the offering forward as we sing the doxology? especially as we stand here together in your presence. We know your blessing and know of your faithfulness to continue blessing us and those around us. And we ask your blessing upon these gifts we bring. <clears throat> Through them, enable us to care for all which, that you've given us here and to reach out in love to all the world and bless the gifts of the talents that you've shared with us as we share freely to be your messengers in a world that is frightening for some at times. Continue to walk with us and through us. This we pray in thy holy name. Amen. As we continue to stand <clears throat> together, let's sing our hymn of departure, Go Tell It on the Mountain, number 218. of Christ attend you, the love of God surround you, the Holy Spirit keep you, that you may live in faith, abound in hope, grow in love, both now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. <clears throat>